I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson, and I am a dentist, and I'm here at Stevenson Dental Group in San Dimas, California. The thing that I think makes this practice so unique is our ability to deal with all dental issues, whether it be the simple and the complex, all in one facility. I think that if you were to come into this practice and get a consult or meet me in person and discuss your dental needs, I think you'd say to yourself, wow, I found someplace special. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and this is five things you need to know about X. X equals dental composite white fillings. When we take a look at these amalgam restorations, which were not done very well, in fact, the clinician here had connected the amalgams together, keeping the patient from being able to floss between the teeth. This is remarkably problematic dentistry. When we remove these amalgams, we can see significant issues underneath. The question is, what do we do? How do we remove the decay and how do we restore these teeth? Do we use a direct restoration or an indirect restoration? Well, today we're going to talk about direct restoration, specifically composites. But let me just go back a second and tell you what we mean in dentistry by direct and indirect restorations. When it comes to direct restorations, we're referring to things like silver fillings, amalgams, or composites, like we're going to discuss further today. Also, other things called glass ionomers restorations that are typically used in people that have a very high cavity rate. And then finally, we have direct filling gold, also known as gold foil. One of the materials I love to do today is gold foil restorations. In the indirect category, we have restorations that are made by a dental laboratory. Now I use that term restoration, and what I mean is crown, onlay, veneer, anything that we as a dentist do to restore your teeth, we refer to as a restoration. So indirect restorations of gold, porcelain fused to metal, glass ceramic, or zirconia are all being used today in dentistry. But we're gonna focus on the direct and specifically on composite. How many composites is America doing? What is the US dental market size when it comes to direct plus indirect, but more specifically, what about composites? We'll take a look at the entire marketplace. Three billion dollars by the year 2026 will be spent on direct and indirect restorations. But let's zero in on one year. Let's pick 2020, for example. And let's look at this a little bit more closely and we can see here that the direct restoration percentage is greater than the indirect restoration percentage. And when we look even more carefully at that direct restoration breakdown, we're looking at a significantly larger amount of composite restorations being performed compared to the amalgam restorations. We have pretty much as a profession decided that amalgam is no longer the material of choice for direct restorations. We've jumped in full force with the composite dental mindset. How safe are these composites? How good are they? Do they last as long as amalgams? Are they actually biocompatible? So let's talk about the five things you need to know about composites. First of all, they're not 100% biocompatible. Number two, you need to isolate with something that is gonna allow you to obtain the best physical properties possible, and that would be a rubber dam. You must protect the pulp. When you take out a cavity and you put in a filling, there needs to be something before the filling is placed, something to secure the bond and something to protect that composite from breakdown over time. Number four, they are highly technique sensitive. These are not the same as silver fillings. Silver fillings could be done by anybody, any day, with basically minimal skill set required to do an amalgam filling that would actually work. Composites are very different. 
we must focus all of our energies and all of our attention to detail to make a composite that lasts a long time. And then finally, finishing and polishing extends the lifetime of the restorations. And I mention this because the time that's required to place a composite is going to be much greater than what you're used to if you've had silver fillings in the past. Let's tackle that first one. They're not biocompatible. Well, when we take a look at what's happening with composites today, we can look at some of these studies. For example, this one here, according to Dr. Gordon Christensen's research, 43% of dentists that were surveyed are seeing problems around the margins of the composites. In other words, they're seeing leakage of some kind. They're seeing this almost at a, you know, a pandemic level. If we look at the reasons why this might be happening, we can see things like uncured resin, gaps that are occurring. Uh, maybe it's because the composite doesn't have the ability to fight off cavities. Very interesting. Let's take another look at maybe just the components of composite. I mean, is composite safe? And I, I would say, yes, composite is, is safe, but is it completely 100% biocompatible? No. Let's take a look at the release and toxicity of dental resin composite. Now, this is a study done about 10 years ago by Gupta's group, and they basically admit that most dentists use composites to fill teeth. And they also say that, you know, we have some concerns about toxicity because these composites do release uh, some chemicals that we are somewhat concerned about. And finally, they state that the initial release of the free monomers, that means the molecule before it becomes a polymer, that conversion and the long-term release of leachable substances is generated by erosion and degradation over time. In other words, you have free monomers at the time of placement, and then you have leachable activity occurring as you chew on these composites, as you brush, and just over time, they do start to break down. Well, where do all those chemicals go? In addition, there is an ion release and proliferation of bacteria located at the interface between the composite and the tooth structure. So that is also going to possibly cause inflammatory reactions at the interface with the composite and the tooth structure. You're thinking, wow, that's a lot of problems. Well, every dental material we use has some minor toxicity to it. There are very few that are pure. I, yeah, I have to go back to gold. Gold is the one material that we have that has zero toxicity problems with it. But with composite, we have to be aware of this fact and we have to make sure we take certain steps to mitigate the problems associated with this material that we all love to use. If we were to look at a clinical trial by this Whitworth group here, and this is done in 2005, they looked at 602 teeth filled with amalgam and composite. And what did they find after three years? They found that 16 cases required root canals and that composite was more than two times more likely to cause root canals than amalgam. Wow, composite, tricky stuff. We have to be really mindful of the fact that this material isn't as user-friendly. When we see a patient like this, we can see that there's been erosion and substances from the composite are le leaching out and leaching into the saliva, into the body, and uh, th the body can usually take care of these just fine. The point is, we just need to understand that composite is not the perfect material that so many people think it is. It is problematic. It breaks down. It falls apart over time and it will need to be replaced occasionally. This particular patient was well aware of that fact and decided to restore her teeth with gold. And I'm just showing you here a gold onlay on one of the two teeth that she had replaced as her way of overcoming this problem that she, she had with composite. She just was not willing to go through this process of watching it fall apart over time. She wanted to have something that was gonna last long-term, perhaps even a lifetime. So the research is telling us very clearly that we need to follow the manufacturer's recommendations. That's just essential. 
Cavity lining is really important and it needs to be done in deep areas. This is going to help protect the pulp. Also, there should be no contact with the human body with this product before it's polymerized. In other words, while the procedure is being done, it's really important that everything be properly isolated so that we don't get exposed to some of these things that can cause allergic reactions in some patients, contact dermatitis, inflammatory responses of the soft tissue, and in the pulp itself. If we move into the next topic, rubber dam, I think it's really apropos because rubber dam is the way you can help protect your patient, or you're a patient, this is the way you can be protected against the material problems, like some of these toxic elements in there, toxic compounds, and also it allows the dentist to do better dentistry. So although we can't have a sterile environment in the mouth, we can have a clean environment. Let me just show you an example. Uh, this is an example of a rubber dam placement, but let me show you perhaps another one where we're gonna be performing a class two restoration, a composite on that premolar next to the gold restoration. And the area is isolated with the rubber dam. This is a lovely environment to work in. This is how dentists really want to work. Most dentists that don't use rubber dam will say, I don't wanna use it because I don't think my patients will like it, or oh, it takes too much time. And actually, that's not true. Patients appreciate the rubber dam, and once it's placed, the procedures go efficiently, and you get the best out of the materials. So in this particular case, a small preparation was done on the back side, the distal side of this premolar, and it was restored with composite resin, utilizing many steps and many different materials along the way. During the entire process, not a drop of saliva contaminated the area. There was no bleeding. There was no contact of the materials to the human body. None of the composite material touched the gingiva, the gum area, and everything was done in a clean environment and rendered a very nice result. For us at our practice here at Stevenson Dental Education, Stevenson Dental Group, this is the absolute standard. We do this on essentially every direct and indirect procedure that we do. Let's look at the third most important factor that I want to talk about today, and that is you need to protect the pulp. Now, the pulp is the nerve, the artery, the vein, and the lymphatic system that is located within side of the tooth. It has the capability of repairing the tooth over time as long as it's kept healthy. So let's protect the health, the health of the pulp at, at every uh, turn that we have. For example, here, this is a case done by one of my grad students, Dr. Mudit Yadav. He's also one of our associates here at, at our teaching center and at our clinical practice. And you can see he's isolated this molar tooth beautifully. He's taken out a very large cavity, and then he's provided us with a pulpal protection procedure. Look at the far right-hand side, and you can see that sort of opaque covering there is placed on purpose to protect the pulp from the underlying decay and the insult of the, the, the byproducts of the composite itself. His final restoration is beautiful, it's lifelike, and this is the kind of dentistry that we like to do on every patient that walks into our practice. Let's take a look at a more serious situation. Now this is one from when I was teaching at UCLA, and this patient here came in with no pain, but she did notice she had a hole in the side of her tooth. The tooth tested vital. Now what does that mean? The tooth was alive. There wasn't a problem with the nerve. So the tooth still had that capability to repair itself. The pulp was still functional. The pulp was able to deal with the insult of whatever it is that we were gonna to do to this tooth. And when the student ventured into this procedure and started it, unfortunately, she was a little bit heavy handed and she actually was exposing the pulp. And you can see here that that red area in the middle, that little triangular, those three dots there, represents the actual nerve and pulp chamber of the tooth. Now the decay had been removed, but the pulp was exposed. Whenever we can, we like to leave a little bit of decay behind near the pulp and place a protective liner on top of it. That is a great way to avoid getting a pulp exposure because once you get a pulp exposure, things kind of get more 
questionable in terms of long-term survivability. So we want to keep this pulp unexposed. However, occasionally we expose a pulp. So what do we do? Let's talk about how to deal with that. So let's take a look at a study that, that was really focusing on how to deal with the direct pulp cap. In other words, when the nerve was exposed, when the pulp was exposed. And this group out of Oregon, led by Dr. Hilton, looked at 35 different practices, and they divided up the practices into 16, placing calcium hydroxide, that's COH, that's one type of material, and 19 placing MTA, okay, which is mineral trioxide aggregate. And this product has been used for quite some time now to perform as a pulp healing material. When they looked at the group of patients after two years, they found that 31.5% of the time, calcium hydroxide resulted in failure, or only 19.7% of the time that MTA was used, we had failure. If we look at another study, then this was done at a dental school in Germany, and they looked at 229 teeth over a period of 10 years, and they found that they had 80.5% success rate utilizing MTA versus calcium hydroxide. They also found that whenever you have a pulp cap, direct pulp cap situation, it's best just to go ahead and place the direct restoration that day. Don't delay. When they delayed, their success rate dropped dramatically. So I think that we should take a look at steps for the modern pulp cap. And when you go to your dentist to have your procedures done, you probably could sit down with them, ask them, how do you approach a pulp capping procedure? What materials do you use? Are you following the seven steps? So these steps are really as follows. Number one is diagnosis. You've got to make sure that the tooth will heal itself. In other words, it cannot be a tooth that's headed south. It cannot be a case of pulpitis where the pulp is so infected that it's going to die over time. You have to make sure this tooth can heal itself. Number two, you need to isolate with rubber dam. This is just an absolute, there are no exceptions to this because all the studies that have looked at pulp capping success rates, they all use rubber dam. So we have to stick with the techniques that we know work. We need to make sure that we remove decay around the periphery. You can leave decay behind. I know that sounds terrible, but actually leaving decay behind is the most evidence-based appropriate approach to dealing with deep decay. Leave some decay behind, but you must have a clean periphery because that will provide you with an area to bond and that'll provide you with an area where you can place a liner to create a proper seal. And we wanna make sure that there's no blood. If the tooth is bleeding, that means that there's a lot of inflammation and it probably needs to go directly to a root canal. So we need to make sure that that stops within about 10 minutes. We need to make sure that we use MTA or something like MTA. There are MTA synthetics that are out there and they all work fantastic. We need to seal it after the MTA with some kind of a liner. We need to tack down the MTA. In other words, we like to make kind of a sandwich. So we create the MTA first and then we cover the MTA with a liner and then we can start to place our composite. We would never want to place the composite directly on top of the pulp. After all, we know the toxicity of the composite is a potential risk. And then finally, we want to restore immediately. And this means some kind of definitive restoration. In this case, we're probably going to be placing some kind of a composite. So make sure the tooth that you're going to be working on does not have a diagnosis of irreversible pulpitis. It's got to have a vital pulp it's got, or it's got to have what we call reversible pulpitis. It should have no lingering pain after removal of any stimuli. We need to have no history of spontaneous pain, no pain on percussion. That means you're tapping it with something and we should have no periapical radiolucency. In other words, if we look at the root area here, it should look nice and intact with no area of, of lack of bone around the end of that tooth area. The mineral trioxide aggregate is a complex uh, substance. It has many different calcium silicates in it, and it is essentially a friendly, biocompatible 
material that stimulates regrowth of tooth structure underneath the cavity. There are others too. Here's one made by Septodont called Biodentine. I love this product, I use it all the time, and this is used to cover over the pulp area. So after placing the MTA or MTA-like substance like Biodentine, we're now going to seal the pulp cap. In other words, we have to place something around it that tacks it down and keeps it in place. Think of this, the MTA is the medicine and the, the liner would be like the bandage. Okay, and this will hold it in position. So this is a two-step process for us. We like to use a low viscosity material. It's not particularly strong, but it flows well and covers well. And then we like to place something on top of that, another glass onomer that provides for a little bit of bulk. This will reduce the shrinkage that we see with composites, and it's very strong. So when we place our final restoration here, we know that we have a really good firm base underneath the composite. This was a procedure done entirely by a UCLA student. I think she did a fantastic job. And this result here was featured in an article that I co-published that showed long-term success of pulp capping utilizing this particular technique. By this time you're thinking, wow, dentistry is really complex. There's a lot going on and you have to rely on a lot of materials. Well, that's true, but it's also really technique sensitive too. And for example, look at this chart. This is meant to irritate you, okay? So hopefully this is irritating you. But basically what we're showing you here is as of 2022, dentists are faced with eight different ways that they can fill a cavity. Eight different methods. Every one of these methods has got good parts and very good parts and excellent parts to it. And it's, it's complex. So when we approach situations that involve fillings, we have to realize that we need to come up with a technique that is indicated for the situation at hand. And hopefully your dentist has an algorithm that they will restore small fillings a certain way, large fillings a different way. The key is you need to be treating all of these in a customized way. Not one filling can tr be treated the same way in every situation. Here's an example of a horribly deep cavity that goes way down. You can see the yellow area there, the little arrow, that was restored entirely with a glass onomer restoration. This is a way to stop the bleeding, if you will. In other words, to stop the decay before it gets worse. This is just one really interesting way that you can solve these problems, but to attack a situation like this with a filling is really complex. So don't be surprised if your dentist says, I can't do a filling here, I need to do a crown. Because a crown is another way to get access to this area with a lot more control. We do have post-op sensitivity issues in dentistry when it comes to dentin bonding and composite placement. And uh, it happens extremely rarely when you follow certain protocols. I don't think I experienced with my patients post-operative sensitivity hardly ever. But it is a problem in some practices. And one of the things that you can have your dentist do is make sure they use some kind of bacterial killer, some kind of antibacterial agent that gets put into the restoration, into, I'm sorry, the preparation before the restoration is placed. And one of them out there is called Gluma. So you can just ask your dentist, hey, are you gonna be using Gluma to help reduce post-operative sensitivity? Or perhaps because you know that the collagen network that you're trying to bond to is very vulnerable and it can break down because of your body's own enzymes, we can use something to stop these MMPs, these matrix metalloproteinases, from breaking down all the dentin bonds and all the collagen and we can use something called chlorhexidine digluconate. And this was really advocated by a scientist named Leo Tatarjan out of Finland and if we utilize cavity cleanser, 2% chlorhexidine, we can reduce the amount of these enzymes and then we can extend the life of our restorations. So the technique sensitivity is pretty high when it comes to composites. Let's take a look at a case which is failing with decay around it. This is a composite and rubber dam was placed. The old composite was removed, you can see here and then we remove the decay around the periphery. 
And then we have to utilize at this point some kind of cavity cleanser. In this case, I use 2% uh, chlorhexidine. I find this material to be incredibly effective, not only at reducing sensitivity, killing bacteria, and minimizing the amount of the endogenous enzymes of the body, the MMPs, from breaking down the composite bond over time. Because this was fairly close to the pulp, we treated it like it was a pulp exposure and laid down MTA. On top of the MTA, is the bandage, right? First the medicine, then the bandage. So now the bandage here that's going to tack down the MTA and allow it to do its work is the glass isomer liner. At this point, we just approach this like any composite. We etch it, we prime it, and we rinse this off. We add our bonding material, and then we can create a reasonable good seal with this bonding protocol, and then we can restore the tooth with the composite utilizing this matrix system, all these little rings that kind of go around the tooth and this little band that creates a wall through which you can place the material. So now we're building a wall. We like here this, we take off the band and now we have this ring system that has been removed but we created a wall which we filled with composite in a couple of increments and now we're good to go. When we take off the rubber dam, when we check the bite and make sure the bite is good, we can then go into polish. That's what that blue stuff is. You, your, pay, your doctor says, hey, bite down on this, tap, tap, tap. And what they're doing is they're marking this little ink on the surface to see where the areas are hitting too high. So wouldn't you agree, dentistry is pretty complex and the technique sensitivity of composites is at the maximal level. So if you ever feel like a composite was rushed, it means probably something is going wrong. Composites need to be done carefully, meticulously, in a stepwise manner. There is no easy way to do composites quickly. They have to be done carefully. And then finally, the finishing and polishing that we do extends the lifespan of these restorations. And it's many steps too. So after you finish doing the tap, 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 and the dentist has to grind on the tooth a little bit, they need to make sure they polish it completely. Leaving you with a rough surface is only going to attract plaque, bacteria, and it even leads to micro cracks in the surface of the composite, which can reduce its longevity. So make sure your dentist spends ample time polishing the restoration. They may at first, Take something like you can see here where there's on that number, uh, I'm not gonna give you the tooth number, but on that bicuspid there where you see the composite is too wide on the inside part, the lower part, we can remove that. See the dotted red lines that can remove that area. Then we can smooth that roughened area that you know we remove the, the excess area, but it's still rough. And we can use discs for that. We can enhance the anatomy with burrs these are drills. We can polish it then with different polishers and we can end up getting a very nice final finish. Here I'm just showing uh, a very simple composite where we're utilizing discs and we're utilizing these burrs or carbide drills to shape the surface of the composite and then finally utilizing some kind of an abrasive to create a slick and smooth surface that is not going to have any roughness, not going to have any areas that will leave the surface uh, irregular or prone to cracks or fractures. Uh, the color here is not perfect because the teeth will dehydrate while the procedure is being done with the rubber dam in place. When the rubber dam comes off, this color will neutralize and it'll look actually just like tooth structure. So the five things you need to remember are composites, they're not biocompatible 100%, no way. You need to use rubber dam to get the best possible results out of your composite. You need to figure out a way to protect the pulp and if the pulp gets exposed, you better know how to deal with it at that point with utilizing MTA or an MTA-like product. This is a highly technique sensitive material, a highly technique sensitive approach, so it takes time to do it right. And then finally, finishing and polishing Seems like the last thing you worry about at the end, but it's probably one of the most important. You need to leave yourself 
with an incredibly smooth surface so you get the best longevity out of the composite and hey it feels good too so thank you for paying attention to this five things you need to know about composites i'm dr stevenson we'll catch you next time